Mr. Young, I'm an occupational therapist. Some of you I already know. And thank you, Irma, for asking me to do this. Thank you um, for being here. I'm just delighted. And I'm so delighted to know that uh, you all have a blank slate as far as vision goes, right? Good, good. Okay. So my purpose here is to indoctrinate, indoctrinate you. You'll see what I mean. Um, let's see. And congratulations for choosing to do this class. This class is an elective, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys were very smart, very wise to do this, right? Yes. Because, right. because how often do you use your vision every day? All the time. Yeah, quite a bit. Quite no. a bit. Um, and uh, I guess, I guess I, I really, I think that the vision part of occupational activity is something that, unfortunately, EOPs <coughs> have not always grasped really well. And so, really, that's why I, I congratulate you on doing this. Okay, so let's see. So I've been a therapist forever. Uh, since God made dirt. And um, I work... I work at the uh, at Athens Regional Medical Center, and I've been there for 21 years. Holy wow. cow! Mm -hmm. And um, I can't believe it. And um, I worked on inpatients. I worked in the dysphagia program, dysphagia for some of you. Um, I work right now. I work in um, outpatient rehab. I do driving clinical driving evaluations, um, neuro rehab, um, and low vision. Um, and then I just got a part-time job. My husband's looking for a job. If anybody knows a job for a biochem engineer, please let me know. Um, but uh, so I so I took on a part-time job at Vistas, which is a center in um, Athens for visually impaired and blind folks. I also have a new another part-time job in home healthcare. This is going to be really interesting. <laughs> okay. So here's our outline. Um, my perspective and experience with low vision, the big picture, the service delivery models, um, vision, occupational performance, and um, OT, which is which I'm largely stealing from Mary Warren. Does, has anybody heard of Mary Warren? Okay, so a couple, yes. A very Was it just two? Yes. There's three. Three? Good. Is that it? All right, I am really getting Pavla Rasa. Okay. Um, and then uh, this I stole from her also, her hierarchy. Actually, she wants all of us to know about that. And tell me if I get in your way, okay? Um, then we're gonna do some basic testing and I'm gonna demonstrate and then um, talk about most frequent diagnoses, what to do. I have some testing materials with me, so, and I have some glasses, so if yep. we have time, we'll just, We'll you guys can practice doing some basic testing. that's a very important part basic of this. Testing. Yeah, Tracy. And yeah. if you need anything from us, we can get it pretty quickly. <coughs> I think I, I'm sure I missed something. Well, we'll see how it goes. This is the Argo Logo. Yeah, this is Argo Logo. Okay, so I graduated in 1988. Some people might not have even been born then. I was born that year. You were born that year? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. Three years ago, I'm going to do that actually. That's so funny. Okay. So I came to work at Athens Regional in 1990. Um, I do get bored. You know, I've been at the same job for so long, and I do get bored. Um, and so I go on the next great adventure and the next thing to learn. So that's how come I've ended up with this like bag full of weird skills. Um, I'm also very nearsighted. I used to be very nearsighted. And, um, and I think that was part of what attracted me to, um, to working with vision. Um, my mom is also nearsighted, and her favorite thing to say is that she can't tell the difference between a spoon and a fork at arm's distance. And it really is about the truth. Mm -hmm. I was so nearsighted that without my glasses, I could not tell what time it was, even though the numbers on the clock were this big. You know, I mean, really nearsighted. Is anybody else nearsighted? All the nearsighted people who you take your contacts out and you can't see. I like that description. The difference yeah, between yeah, the yeah, really yeah. nearsighted. Yeah. 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 Me too. Okay. And my hand comes into focus about right here. Yeah. 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 I have LASIK. I have LASIK too. That's why I was wondering if that's where you were going. I was like, yeah, I, mean, I had LASIK, yeah. Well, Tracy, what does it mean then when my doctor said, 
Irma, you're not a good candidate for LASIK, and he said because I was a little too fidgety. I don't know why he said that. Maybe I'm sure. Turning your eyes back and forth. And they were the lights are going in. Anyway, we'll talk about it. Yeah, I don't. I have no idea why. Um, so in my humble opinion, the brain is the coolest. Way, way cool. It just blows me away how the brain works and I don't understand it all, of course, and it just, it's just amazing to me. So, um, and then I have to, I have to admit I have some hubris. Um, I was interested in vision for uh, quite a while and, um, I had taken all of Mary Warren's classes, all the conferences, the weekend conferences, and um, and I'd also taken a class from um, Martin Scheinman, who's an OD up at the Pennsylvania School of Optometry, and his wife's a pediatric OT, and took his course, and just almost anything I could find um, for conferences. And um, Mary Warren, who worked at the, uh, she's an OT, and she worked at the um, Kansas City Eye Hospital in Missouri for a, a very long time, I believe. She um, went over to uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham and started a graduate level certificate in low vision rehab. And um, I applied for the first class. I wasn't accepted for that, but I was accepted for the second class, so I'm the second graduating class from that. Um, and here's where the hubris is. I thought, you know, it was, it's one class a semester. It was all online except for one weekend we met to be tested out. And I thought, no sweat. I've taken so many conferences from her. I'm not going to really have to study very much. <laughs> no, no. I oh, learned wow. a whole bunch. I really, I really worked hard. See, because I want to take that next. So. Oh, take <laughs> it. Take it. It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Okay. But it was, it was a lot would, of work. Would you suggest that, um, that these OT graduates, I mean, they'll be, they'll be out the practicing in 2012? Fall if they wait a year or two. Yeah, I would, wait down. A year. No. I would wait a year or two this unless you're blessed with later. a lot of energy okay. and you don't have a relationship or, and you don't have kids. Yeah, if you've got. Or experience, with, I'm sure that helps with this course with some. To know yeah, that. That, would, that would help. <laughs> yeah, that does help. It, it, was, it, was, it was hard, it was certainly doable. But it was hard. I worked a lot harder than I thought. And there was a lot more to learn than I realized. Okay. So here's um, here's one of my uh, one of my things. Um, lo working in low vision and occupational therapy is a specialty. It is a specialty. Um, AOTA even has a specialty certification for, for low vision, and that came about I think maybe 2006. Wow, 2006. How do you know that, Pam? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in it. Very good. Yes, and, it's it's and I know that Mary Warren's course is, I think it's 17 credit hours. Two yes, it is. yes, it is. 17, 17 credit hours. Yeah. 17 like graduate, a minor. 17 right? graduate mm -hmm. level. Okay, yeah. good to know, too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's over three years. We had classes either one or two summers. Plus, there's some observation. It's, I think, about 40 hours for one class. Yeah, so it was it was well, a lot. Tracy. Now I'm kind of not to get too into it, but uh -huh. um, how, what, what are your uh, qualifications for being accepted? I mean, when you said you weren't accepted in the first class because too many OTs, or because uh, I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know. I had already been working in low vision um, for probably about I think about five years. Oh, okay. There's a low vision. Uh, optometrist in um, Athens, John Forche, yeah. and he he had trained me, plus I'd taken all those courses, yeah. and um, so I so I already had experience yeah. in, in that okay. area. Yeah, I don't know, I think they do get, the check -in they're in. always looking for more students. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in my opinion, all OT should be able to recognize low vision, okay? Um, and there's two reasons, so that you can help your patients functionally and also so you can help your patients get appropriate therapy. Okay. Um, so 
So I think that the best practice is when OTs refer the clients to to a low vision specialist, or at least you know at least call and chat. Okay. Um, and I don't think that low vision as a specialty is recognized completely by by the occupational therapy world. I could be wrong about that. It's getting better. I was just telling them that AOTA had. Mitchell Scheinman was there in Philadelphia uh -huh. last year, and there were at least three, three papers, posters, and then that three-hour uh, good work, uh, good short course. Good. Well, in my in my hospital, we have a case manager on the neuro unit, and um, we had a patient who had a, um, a left hemianopsia, mm -hmm. right? Um, and she lived quite a ways away, and I was trying to explain to this nurse case manager that really she should the patient should come to see me and she just didn't get it. So that okay. patient was discharged without coming back? Um, the patient was discharged and sent to a rural hospital to a generalist OT. Mm -hmm. And and Did you get a call? For the generalist, no, oh. no, no, I didn't. I didn't. See, you fact, guys call for people like this. Yeah, call, and I'm going to give you my my phone number and my um, email. Um, no, and in fact, I kind of pushed the nurse uh, case manager and offended her, which I was I apologize for later. But she just didn't get that it's a specialty. And remember me before I went to before I did the UAB um, program, I really didn't get it either. You know, I thought I knew everything. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about the service delivery models. Okay, um, there's there's two systems. There's kind of the blind educational model, and then there's the medical model. Okay, think of Helen Keller. Okay, Helen Keller. She went to blind schools, right? And that was way back when. So I think they were just starting these blind schools. So there's a whole, um, and that's that's an educational model school, right? Um, and there's professionals that come out of that educational model, and and the educational model slash blind school folks, they've been the ones who have been handling the people with you know complete vision loss, and um, and also the low vision. And one thing about their, um, I think it's changing, but. One thing that they've, one of their kind of philosophical underpinnings has been that if you've got vision loss, you should learn to function as a blind person and not use your vision. Okay. So, um, and Mary Warren's position, and you can tell, I mean, I'm a total convert with her. Um, her position is that is that you know, like 96% of our brain. Um, Processes vision information in some way. We are we are like hardwired to use our vision, and people will use their vision. They will use their residual vision, whatever vision they've got left. They'll just keep trying to use it. You just keep trying to use it. So her thing is capitalize on that. Teach people how to best use their residual vision so they can do their occupations. Okay. I see. I see people writing through. See, we're, we will give you this handout, right? I mean, I can. Oh, sure. I can. I can copy it, so you can just kind of take these, because I know this is really important, and I kind of you're oh, visually processing. You'll you'll get this handout. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. I was yeah. afraid if I should be like. No, no, no. I knew that, that that's what they were thinking. I kind of we have a little mind meld. I'm going. They're writing really fast, and if yeah. it was me, I wouldn't be listening if I have to write. So yeah. 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 Well, well and this is your first class too. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so the blind system. Um, I think there's a blind school down in Macon. Yes, I was yes. going to ask you. There's still that one blind school in I Macon for the state. Yeah, I think there is. There's uh, the Center for Visually Impaired in Atlanta, CVI, um, and that's kind of out of the blind model, blind educational model. There's also another center up in Smyrna. Is that North Atlanta? <laughs> no, that's West. It's north of Atlanta, like the northwest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's Smyrna. I'm not really sure. Um, oh, but so, and they're, they're again kind of in the blind educational model. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me see. What did I have? Okay. Okay. So um, the blind and educational model, they run off of grant money and education.
educational money, like ta like taxes and stuff, right? Right? So they have a completely different funding system, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the CBI uh, website, they're like, they've got this big old link on the left that says, you know, you want to donate to us? <laughs> yeah, so it's very different. Then you've got the medical model, okay? And for vision, um, in the medical model, it's been the ophthalmologist, and those are medical doctors who have an additional specialty in vision. They diagnose, they do surgery. Some of them do a little bit of, of prescriptions for glasses, which are also called optics. Um, then you've got your optometrist, okay? Got your optometrist, and they have a doctor of optometry. Um, and you know, and I think their course of education is a little bit shorter, but Dr. Berger, she'll, she'll, talk she'll speak more to that because she's an OB, she'll, mm -hmm. be, she'll be here. And then therapists. So one thing I want to tell you guys about, this is very interesting in um, our occupational therapy history with low vision. So Mary Warren is working at the eye hospital in Kansas City, I think like through the 80s, the early 90s. Um, and there's a doctor there, Donald Fletch, <coughs> Fletcher, Fletchman or Fletcher, and he's an ophthalmologist, right? He's a Canadian ophthalmologist. He's working there at the, at the eye hospital, and he's really impressed with Mary Warren and what the OTs have to contribute to this area of rehab with the, with the low vision folks. So eventually, Dr. Fletcher, that's his name, Dr. Fletcher goes to our Congress and lobbies to get Medicare to cover low vision <coughs> under Medicaid, Medicare, okay? So that OTs can put, you know, whatever the diagnosis is, whatever their acuity level is, that's how you do the diagnosis, the treating diagnosis. He lobbies and successfully our Congress to start in, including that in Medicare. Pretty cool, okay? Pretty cool. Okay? So before that, you know, their occupational therapists really couldn't get paid. There wasn't a mechanism to get paid. Okay. So in medical, I'm sure you all know, we are um, in the medical system, we're paid um, not really by grants and tax money, but we're paid by Medicare, Medicaid, and health insurance. And sometimes we're not paid. <laughs> okay. So I kind of talked about a lot of this already. So the players, the ophthalmologists, um, generally they're not familiar with rehab. They're getting better about it, but but really, in my town there's some older ophthalmologists. I never hear from them. There's a couple younger ones, and I do get referrals from them. Not as often as I think I should, but I do get referrals from them. Um, optoma optometrists, eye valves, diagnoses, optic scripts. If they see something really fishy, they refer on to an ophthalmologist or to a neurologist. Um, not, all, not all optometrists are the same. There are some optometrists that do your, you know, kind of regular routine, run-of-the-mill evaluation, um, eye evaluation, that, you know, give you a uh, prescription for glasses, and that's about it. There's some that specialize in low vision, they're looking more at people's function, and they're more kind of akin to us in rehab because they're, they're focused on function than the ophthalmologist. Um, then there's OT, and uh, Mary, Mary Warren says, we are not low vision therapists, we should not call ourselves low vision therapists, because there actually is a low vision therapist from the educational model, okay? And they're, they're teachers, they do a lot what we do, I think a lot of a lot of them are also educated in teaching Braille. Okay. Thank you so much for that, um, Tracy, because it, it we run into that all over. Like, for example, people say, "I'm a hippo therapist," or "I'm a burn therapist," or "I'm a hand therapist." If we don't say we're occupational therapists first, you know, and we specialize in these yeah. things, yeah. we'll always be in this soup. That like, what what is it that you do? I'm confused. Yeah. Well, say you're an OT. That's what you. Do. Yeah. You know, and and I say, I, yeah, I specialize in low vision. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
braille instructors, orientation and mobility specialists, the people that teach folks to use the white cane, you know, dog bites, stuff like that, okay? They're also from the educational system. Okay, so, um, like I said, 96%, something like that, of the brain is used for visual, um, for visual whatever. Um, so you're really looking at the brain vision system complicated and man so is that environment so is that treatment environment so um, to effect effectively teach the or treat the patient you are dealing with a lot of different players in different systems they even have completely different funding mechanisms and they're in different offices <laughs> you know it's not like it's like a, not like a hospital where you know the pharmacy, the nurses, and the doctors are all in one place. Uh uh, people are spread out all over the place. In fact, they're spread out into different towns. You know, um, so one thing that you all can do as students is is survey the environment, know what your resources are. If whenever you go to work, you know, which is what in a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you go to work, <laughs> yeah, yay, paycheck. Um, when you go to work, um, you know, I don't know where you're going to end up, of course, probably you don't either, but you know, one thing you could do as far as this vision piece of the puzzle goes is kind of figure out what your resources are. Who, you know, is there anybody in town that specializes in, in low vision? And it would be really easy to look up on the um, American. Um, uh, Optometric Association um, website, and you know, just Google, Google it, find out if somebody's specializing. They probably will be surveying the environment right now on their case project. So start that one, guys. We will, we'll get there. They're going to do cases, tra um, traces. Right. So while they're talking with people like you or whoever they're going to see, they can survey the environment and see what's there. Yeah. We can bring that back. Okay. So now we're going to do Mary Warren Land. Actually, so vision, occupational performance, and OT. Um, I'm so glad I'm the first class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the role of vision is to um, filter, organize, and integrate sensory information so you can make an adaptive response to the environment, right? So OT 101, okay? Um, all, uh, all of the central nervous system is devoted to taking in the sensory input, analyzing it, and responding to it. Right? You guys know this. Okay. The definition of low vision. A visual impairment severe enough to interfere with occupational performance but allowing some usable vision. Usable vision. Or residual vision. That's how, that's how, we, how we chart. Yeah, residual vision. So patient completed fill in the blank occupation using compensatory strategies and her residual vision. Okay, OT role. This is really important, you guys. Really, really important. That's why I folded it. So OT, we treat the dysfunction, not the diagnosis. Not the diagnosis. We treat the dysfunction. Okay. So I've got, I've got, now this is me, this is not Mary Warren, but you know, of course, I, she's taught me this. So um, I've got a couple of scenarios here. So 74, or 74 year old woman, she lives in her daughter's home. She's got kind of advanced Alzheimer's, and she's got some really bad math, macular degeneration. She's considered legally blind. I'll tell you more about what that is later. Um, she needs total assist for everything, including her feeding, because of the cognitive deficit. And, you know, does she need, Low vision, OT? No. Yeah. Talk to Does she? I don't know. I mean, if she has a cognitive deficit, is she going to override her vision at all? Then, yeah. What would you get? Yeah. Possibly. Well, she's not completely blind. She's still got some vision. Legally blind, I'll just go ahead and spill the beans now. Legally blind is 20 slash 200. And that is more legal, and it's, it's later in the slides too, so you guys don't need to write it down. And it's more, um, it's more of a um, legal cutoff because I, I, that's when people are eligible for services like um, SSI, Social Security mm -hmm. um, benefits and stuff like that. 
Um, so she's like, so she's got some vision. She's got what would usually be considered some residual usable vision, but she's got so many cognitive deficits. Nah, it wouldn't. I mean, you just wouldn't. You, you wouldn't really increase her occupational performance. <coughs> okay. Self-feeding because of their cognitive deficits. That means that you know you put that utensil in their hand and they just don't remember that they're supposed to reach forward, put food on the utensil, and get that utensil up to their mouth. And then once they get the food in their mouth, they might start chewing forever, forever, forever because they actually forget that they're supposed to swallow. Okay, so I don't. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know where your grandmother is on that whole, you know, that whole thing. But um, if someone, if someone, if, if you've got an Alzheimer's patient and their their family That's loved ones having to sit there going, swallow, honey, swallow, then yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, you're right, Tracy, to talk about you know as an OT that clinical reasoning about where on the continuum, I mean, my dad is 92, and he won't eat if you feed him, but if you hand him the cup of yogurt and the spoon, he will eat. Uh -huh. So in that case, it would be the OT saying, well, hand him the yogurt and the spoon, and that way he can continue to, because he knows what to do, but, you know, again, he's 92 and he will stop eating if you feed I mean, you know, he'll stop yeah. self-feeding if you yeah. feed him. So yeah. we have tape of daddy feeding himself. He's like, look, he can still do that, so don't, you know. Don't feed him. Yeah. 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 And so, it, so that's the other part. And if he had, mm -hmm. and if he had macular degeneration and that was interfering with his ability to self-feed, mm -hmm. the, the, the occupational therapist might tell, um, might train the caregiver to make sure that he's got contrast when he's eating, yeah. that, that his milk is in a black cup so that he can see there's still milk in the cup. Mm -hmm. Or if he's eating mashed potatoes, it's in a black cup so he can see it. Or if he's eating pea green soup that's dark, that it's in a white cup so he can see that there's still some food contrast. there to eat and keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all examples. It's a judgment call. I mean, yeah. it is a, it's a great field. It's very fun. You guys are going to be able to use your brains and think about stuff, which is, I mean, such a good job, you know? Okay. You guys okay to move on to the next one? Okay. A uh, 30-year-old woman living with her roommate. She has central vision loss due to a uh, past TBI a long time ago. Or, no, I'm sorry, recent TBI. She can't read now. She can't drive. She can't return to work as a cook. Does she need low vision OT? Yeah, yeah, she does. She does, because she was really functional. And now having this TBI and the vision loss has just kind of wiped out all that stuff, okay? 55 year old woman with near blind, and this is based on a patient I saw, it really is. Um, near blindness since birth, never had, never had any services, never in the educational model, um, blind model, um, never in the medical model either. She's married, she's performing cooking, she's cleaning her house, she works in the family business. She does all of her um, IADL except for driving and like financial management, you know, that you have to see to, to read. Her, um, her uh, husband does that. Does she need low vision OT? No, but would you refer to her driving, like a, if she wanted to drive, to a driving resort? Um, no. No, not with near blindness. You just really, yeah, too, not enough vision to drive with. But yeah, I did have this lady come in like this. It was like, you've never had any services? 
She's a black woman. She was actually a little older than 55. She'd gone to, finally had gone to the ophthalmologist or the optometrist, I can't remember who referred her. And they were like, oh, well, she's got vision problems. Let's send her to the OT. And it was like, I saw her once. I did the eval. I was like, man, you are awesome. You were doing so well. <laughs> you know, some people don't do as well with their life as she has. So, yeah. I was so listening to, a, to a, think an about. interview with Ray Charles. The, the one that, uh -huh. uh, did you hear that no, one? No. Uh, but but you know, Jerry amazing. Gross was saying, well, what did, he credited his mother. He progressively lost his vision since he was seven, and he said, my mother started when I was a, a little boy telling me, you know, here's the chair, it will always be there, here's this, and he said, I just became independent, and I still mm -hmm. pack my bags and, and whatever, you know. And he had a challenging lifestyle yeah. because he yeah. was a traveling musician. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, I mean, people, people are amazing. They amaze me. Okay, so back to Mary Warren. So vision is the primary sensory system used to acquire information about the environment. 80 to 90 percent of all learning occurs through the vision channel. That's kind of amazing. Um, 90 percent of all the sensory information is visual. That's pretty amazing. I mean, we are just like, we're just, I don't know. Donald Fletcher, I heard him at a, at a, um, at a conference. He said, he said, you know, the way ophthalmologists think about it is that the, the body just exists to carry around the eyeballs. <laughs> but in a way, it's kind of true. Because look at that. You know, most of your learning occurs through vision. Most of your sensory information is vision. That's kind of it. Okay. Uh, contributions of vision to occupational performance. It helps us anticipate and plan. Okay. So I'm driving here, I live out in the country, um, out in Madison County, kind of by Danielsville. And so I'm driving over here on 129 and I'm behind some, some silver car. And we're a ways back from the traffic light that has just turned red. And we're in the left lane and there's two cars stopped at the light. And um, so I'm behind this guy and, I'm, and then the light turns green and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm gonna stay in this lane because those cars that are stopped, they're gonna take longer to go from a standing, standing stop and go through, you know, through the light and pick up speed. So I'm like, well, I'm gonna stay here with this guy. And this truck, this um, silver car in front of me, he slows down. The light's green and he slows down. And he's like, I hate that. I know, I know. And so I was thinking, I was thinking, wow, this is perfect for the lecture, I have to remember this. <laughs> Because, you know, it turned out, I think that car was lost because they went up to the next turn, made a lefty and a U-turn, and went back the other way. So I think they were lost. I think what it was was that they were distracted. They didn't realize that the light had turned green. But I saw that the light had turned green, so I was anticipating, you know, my movement. So that's just an, a little example of how vision helps you anticipate and plan. Um, did anybody wake up this morning? Was it light enough to see how cloudy it is? No. no. <laughs> okay. So for somebody who woke up a little while ago, who didn't have to be in class as early as you guys, they would have seen that, oh my gosh, it's cloudy, and started to anticipate that maybe they should take their umbrella. So they're planning and anticipating. So it's driving decision making. The vision is driving um, decision making. It um, helps you interpret social interactions, okay? So one of the things that we do that you might not realize is that we're, when we're interested in someone, we raise up our eyebrows. And actually, I can look at all of you, and there's quite a few of you that have your eyebrows raised. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and, um, and so if you have somebody who doesn't have, who has vision loss, um, that can be one of the um, nonverbal um, cues that they miss, and so they feel uncomfortable talking to because they're not getting that cue, that visual cue. Can I speak yeah. of social interactions? Um, I distinctly remember when I met my husband, who has very pretty golden brown eyes. Um, I had heard in a psychology class that uh, when you're very interested in something, your eyes dilate. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. I was talking to him, I remember the first time I met him, we, we were talking, and his eyes dilated, and I thought, Good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, and, and I just thought to 
myself when you said that. I, I always remember that. Yeah. You know, because I was like, hey, yeah. 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 So, yeah. And he couldn't see mine. My eyes are so dark. My eyes were probably dying. Right. And see, yeah. if you had not known that and couldn't see it, you might have had a completely different. It was shortly thereafter that I told my nurse friend we were we were running a clinic. I said, I'm going to marry that child. She thought I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so his eyes suddenly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so social <laughs> interactions. Remember that. You guys were still out there they trying to read them. social cues. <laughs> <laughs> so really, if you need a guy, you know, sometimes they don't talk, so you might try raising your eyebrows to show interest. You feel like you're on one. It's a wide guy. Okay, so vision <laughs> input um, also supplies speed and in information processing, okay? So, and really, you know, think about it. A picture is worth a thousand words. Picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, that's cliche, but it's cliche for a darn good reason. Because, because, and just in your example, you know, seeing your soon-to-be husband's eyes dilate. I mean, you know, that was like quick. instant love. Instant. Yeah, instant. Yeah. Um, dictates motor actions. Okay, so you could use like my example of driving. Um, if you are walking, um, like when you walk into this building, you see the stairs to go down, if you come in the front door. And, um, and so you, you probably don't, you don't think about it, you know, consciously, but you get ready to go down the stairs, okay? Um, early warning system for postural control, that's the same, that example with the stairs would work there too. Causes of visual impairment, disease, macular degeneration, glaucoma, um, gosh, all kinds of stuff. Um, trauma, head injuries, um, benign, sit, benign tumors in the brain, requiring surgery, so the surgery would be the trauma there. Um, aging, there's a lot of age-related changes, um, unfortunately. One age-related change is as we get older, our peripheral vision shrinks down. So that makes driving kind of thing more dangerous. So then you can have a combination of any or all of those. Oh, diabetes, I should have mentioned that. Diabetic retinopathy, that's a big one. You're suitable, okay. It was 30 tracing, or I don't know when, but I needed bifocal. No, it was 50. 50. Oh, my 50th birthday, the very day, all of a sudden, I couldn't, I couldn't. Could, Focus, right? Focus on near, right? So it was bifocal time from then on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So aging is so aging really, yeah, it does make a difference. Yeah, there's a lot of aging changes. And it's just not your eyes. <laughs> anyway, better than the alternative. <laughs> better than the alternative. Okay. Um, so when you have vision impairment, it alters the quality and the quantity of visual input to the central nervous system, or it alters the brain's ability to, um, to use the incoming visual input, okay? Um, the result is a decrease in the ability to use the vision for occupational performance. Um, so if you can't see very well, you have trouble reading, driving, so on and so forth. Looking, doing your financial management. Um, also, you have a decrease in speed of information processing. So, there's quite a few people in here that are nearsighted. Have you ever lost your glasses? Oh. Like that? Have you noticed how much more difficult it is to function? You slow down. How about if you have a contact fallout? Oh, you yeah. Oh. I had to get my glasses fixed at the mall one time, and it was like during the holiday season, and my friend. Literally, it was gonna be an hour. My friend wanted to go do something else, and so she walked me around the mall, and actually like didn't pay attention one time, and I legitimately ran into a pole <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't with all of like the people and everything, like I couldn't differentiate, and I didn't have the depth perception, so I could see something was coming, and I went to the other way, and I only made it so far. 
<laughs> like, okay, yeah. Because well, it messed if, with If you leave these and somewhere her. and I have to write a note, I mean, even if I have to work with one of my kids and, and they're doing a desktop activity, uh -huh. I mean, we've done all the sensory stuff, we've gotten out of the gym, we sit down, and now we're going to write, and I look down and I can't see what they're doing. Yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, and so, and so I yeah. have to find these. I can't yeah. work. And so, um, yeah, you're, it alters the quality and quantity of your visual input. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't do that. Head to my door. Yeah. yeah. You can't perform. <laughs> okay. Um, when I was, when I was probably 15, I stayed at my aunt's house and her puppy, um, I slept on the couch and I put my glasses down on the floor and the mm -hmm. puppy chewed up my glasses mm -hmm. and with them. And we were, we did not have a lot of money. And so it took me like a week to get new glasses. And I had to go to a new high school. It was, it oh. sucked. It sucked, I know. Which is probably why I feel such empathy for people who don't have good vision. So I'm going to this new high school, right? And the, I swear, the, the, the numbers on the doors were about like this, you know? <laughs> And I couldn't see what the, what the room numbers were unless I got like right up to the door. And then the other kids there, I mean, already, you guys probably won't believe this, but, um, but sometimes I'm really shy. And when I was younger, I was really shy. And then I couldn't see. So I couldn't see anybody's facial expressions from any kind of distance. And so I was just like this little, little, it was awful. It was awful. And I know that getting to from one room to the next, I was slow as could be because I just I couldn't you see. Cool. You couldn't. You didn't even have a memory, a visual yeah. memory yeah. of how to get around. Yeah, it was, it, it was a completely new environment. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So visual impairment alters cognitive performance. Okay. Errors, errors because you don't get enough input or it's not accurate enough for decision making. Okay. And I can't remember for sure, but I probably walked into the wrong room several times, you know, which would be my errors there. Um, it changes the way a person responds to their environment and performs their daily activities. Anxiousness and uncertainty, you know, because you just can't see well enough. And some people with macular degeneration, they lose, um, they lose contrast sensitivity, which is the ability to tell the difference between light and dark. And so they can't read the supporting surface. So they really get anxious, you know, because they can't tell what they're walking on. And if they're if they're older and they've had some falls, then they're really, really? anxious. And they've got decreased confidence. Um, you know, a lot of people who have a, a hemonopsia, um, if they're if they don't go through therapy through rehab, then say it's on the right side. What they'll describe is they're out at the store and then all of a sudden there's somebody right there in front of them. And they never saw the person come up because the person came from the right side. And it startles them. It startles them. And so a lot of times people with those um, field cuts, they don't want to go into community environments that are dynamic where things are changing. Uh -huh. Have you treated or can you treat with low vision therapy like light blindness? No, I mean, I mean, I don't know how therapy would really address that, but I know that compensation. Yeah, yeah. Um, retinitis pigmentosa is an eye disease that starts on the periphery and gets worse and worse. And one of the one of the ways that it kind of rears its ugly head is um, night blindness. And um, and really, the thing to do is turn off the lights. You know, if you know if somebody has to go out. They need to use a flashlight or something like that. If their spouse drives them home, they need to make sure that they've got lights, you know, around where the driveway is. Mm -hmm. My cousin has light blindness. I do too. You do? I have. Yeah, my eye blindness is, is pretty bad. I'm I have sorry. To, I gotta have people. Um, I can see to drive at night, but I prefer not to because my yep. eyes are perfectly healthy. But what the op the optometrist found was that um, when it comes to night driving particularly now navigating about the home in the dark is like dialogue in the dark for me. I mean I'm like walking around like this. I can't I can't see anything. But driving in the dark I can see okay but my depth perception is off and he found that that's because some new machine he just tried out um, mapped my eye, the shape of my eye. I don't know if it was the shape of my cornea or the back of the eye, but he found that it, I pick up on too much glare. 
And so when I see halos, they take up like my whole oh, windshield. Okay. And so I don't adjust to the to the light glares as quickly as they told me not to drive. So <laughs> one thing you might one thing you might do is get online and see if you can find any light filters. That they, they're making these new glasses now. I just that will filter glare. Mm -hmm. And when I get out of OT school, that's going to be my treat to myself. But um, they actually they have this wave technology within the lens that you uh -huh. can't see, but it, it cuts the glare out. Yeah. It's like high depth for for night blindness. Cool. My, pretty cool. My little cousin, she is four, and um, so her eyes dilate in the light, and they constrict in the dark. So she has night lights because she gets scared at night. But um, she has little transition lenses. <laughs> They're so cute. <laughs> so that when she's out, you know, they, they dim into sunglasses and then. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. Wow, like her so eyes do all Yeah, that's the good. Like, like, yeah, she's, I mean, it's like a abnormality. Yeah, so I, they tested me for that. Yeah. And then they tested so. me for the amount of rods and cones that I had. And everything mm -hmm. was normal. The only thing they could figure was the, the light adjustment. Like, I just don't adjust. Your the accommodation. Yeah. Because of the yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not off. Because they, they found out cause when she was little, because she would freak out more than, like, the average child mm. at nighttime. Um, and they have an older child who didn't, like, quite to the craziness. And then my uncle, her grandfather is not involved as I mean, he's not the one that checked her out, but luckily, like, he was like, go get her. He was like, a, yeah, support. So um, they went through all kinds of stuff and found out that. Wow. So, but there's, you can't fix it. So. Not that I know. No. Not that no, I mean, yeah, yeah, you can't. Yeah. Because yeah. it's just how our people go. Yeah. Our first semester, we had to, in one of our classes, they made each of us pick a different disability and kind of spend the, was it a couple of days or just one day? It was one just, full day. One day. I was blind. With that, and yeah. I was blind as well. And my my vision uncorrected is like 2,400. It's really, it's pretty bad. So I figured I'll just take my contacts out and like wear sunglasses that are blacked out. And I thought, oh, I'll be fine. I'll just stay in my apartment. But I think part of the assignment was actually go out into the community. So my, yeah. roommate, <laughs> my roommate took me out. I am really scared anyway to go. I mean, that's the first thing I do in the morning is so my contacts and the last thing I do right. like because I cannot see. And I have some of the same. Um, I don't see as well in the light as I do in the dark. And I have really bad depth perception anyway. So I thought, this is a disaster. And she had a disability as well. She was like, uh, I can't remember what Whitley's was. I think she was like paralyzed on one side. So it was like, <laughs> you know, the same old thing. And it was like traumatic for me. I didn't want to go anywhere. You know, I, I can yeah. definitely see the, I mean, I'm anxious anyway, just without my contacts in. And then having, you know, my, I had sunglasses that had just black in the lens. and. It was awful. I thought nothing could be awful, awful being without awful. my contacts, and that was even worse because I get stir crazy. If you have a crazy stir crazy, you can't do anything. Like yeah, I was scared. And like my grandmother had um, glaucoma, mm -hmm. and she's 92, so she's back. there's always somebody. She walks. She has a little roll later, and but she always walks with somebody holding on to her because she's she can't see the if she's stepping down from a curb and. I didn't really understand it quite as much until I was the one that was like completely mm. blind. I, I was like, just don't take me up any stairs. Don't let me be in like a big open space. It was awful. Now remind me, when we get to the part about central vision versus peripheral vision, bring up your grandmother mm -hmm. again, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. My uncle's an optometrist, so oh, okay. I have a little experience with that. Okay. Too. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, just small 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 small. Small. yeah, and you know, I mean, whew. Increased passivity. You didn't want to go do anything. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if vision is so important to occupational performance, why is visual impairment so often overlooked in evaluation and treatment? Mary Warren Coach. wants to know. She says it's because it's a hidden disability and its symptoms are often attributed to other causes. Unless the person has a white cane or a guide dog, you really don't know they've got a visual impairment. Okay. Or you know the visual perceptual hierarchy, which we're going to cover, and you use that hierarchy as I couldn't resist as a lens <laughs> <laughs> to see your patient's performance more clearly. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna that's kind of the next thing. Okay, but really think about it. It's invisible. It's invisible. And I have a lot of patients that say, 
I don't want to go out to Walmart because people will know <laughs> that I've got a disability. I'm like, nobody can look at you and know that you have a disability. Nobody can know. And you know how you know how patient confidentiality is, right? Right? You can't tell anybody about your patient's difficulties. Well, the other day, I couldn't believe it. It was, it was like two weeks ago. I was working with one guy who um, he had um, a pituitary tumor and seizures, and so his um, his left eyelid just stays closed all the time. And then he's he lost, he's got a right-sided hemianopsia, right? So he's working with 25% of his vision, plus a lot of cognitive problems and, and everything. And he's like a sweetheart. He's got awesome social skills. He's just a total sweetheart. And he was leaving as my next patient was coming in, and they and the patient, the next patient was coming out of the speech office, and so they kind of met in the hall. And and uh, my next patient is a um, an engineer who had a stroke and lost again the right side of his vision, right side of hemianopsia. And so, and, and this engineer was one of the ones who said, I don't want to go anywhere. People will know that I've got a disability. And um, and so. The guy with the with the um, pituitary tumor and the kind of you know his cognition's not really great. Neither is the other guy, but not quite as bad. Well, <laughs> the first patient starts talking to the second patient, saying, "I know you, man. Where do I know you from?" <laughs> and they probably did meet each other in work in their work previous work lives. But it was just like I was like, uh, 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 I can't tell either one of them that the person that they're talking to has visual impairment. <laughs> that would be against them, that, you know, that would be against them. Right, but they both did, but they really didn't know that they were talking to somebody else who had visual. I mean, it was very weird. But in the, um, a lot of times in the retirement communities, you know, there's all kinds of people that have macular degeneration. And so if they come across something that helps, then they pass it on to all their friends. So, so in that kind of environment, people will share. Okay. So, you know what, you guys, I'm thinking that you've been in here since 8.30, right? No, 8? Eight? 8. 8. Okay. Is it okay if we take like a five minute break? It is. It is. Is five minutes sufficient? <laughs> is it? See you in five minutes. Okay. Yeah. I better put my yogurt in the Tell me about the lenses that they're now selling. Um, and are they more expensive? 
They are. Dr. Gottlieb's prison? Yeah. Of Valencia. Yeah. Do you know Dr. Gottlieb, Dr. Tracy? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, he's fantastic. Um, he's, a, he's a brother, too. His brother came over here for the open house. It was really weird. I was like, I think, I said, I know a Dr. Gottlieb for optometry. He goes, that's my brother. That, yeah. Yeah. Oh. But um, but these are lenses that like have wave technology and like you can't see it, but in the contour of the uh -huh. lens, like embedded in the glass, is this wave shaped uh -huh. prism that um, so it's like high depth for night, night vision. It cuts out all the layer, and I was like, how much are they? I have no idea because I didn't. I was just ordering contacts that day, just trying to get some more contacts, and he wasn't selling them at the time. But he told me he said if I buy the machine, I'm going to get about like 100 free pairs of these from the manufacturer. I was like, oh, man, down, please. Yeah. I don't you know, know what I go online. I told him I said even if you don't, even if you don't end up getting free surgery, you don't consider me because what they do is it'd be like a study where. Mm -hmm. um, the company would produce all these pairs and then we'd have to give reports on mm -hmm. how it does for our vision functionally. Mm -hmm. um, I said I was so willing to do that. But if, if not, I would purchase them anyway at some point because if it would make it easier for me to see yeah. at night or even at dusk, yeah. you know, it's just... I go online and see it's worth it. Is there a drinking fountain? Yes. Oh, yes. Go down the hallway and then kind of go to the left and you'll see a, a Drinking fountain in the okay. back of the room right now. Okay. It to the left. I did that already, but water. Good to see you. Me too. Are you leaving? No. So, our mom and dad are We got to interrupt Doug and ask how your parents were doing. Oh, they're good. Thank you for asking. Daddy's just a, just a little trooper. <laughs> Mom's doing well too. She had a little bout of a diabetic okay, scare um, with her blood sugar. I, uh, but, oh my goodness. Um, Earl, what time are we breaking? 11 o'clock? Uh, yeah, we're, we're having a